Hi, my name is Mattia Murray, and welcome to The Longer Road. You are on The Longer Road if you have multiple intersectional identities that are often marginalized. You've had to work harder to get to the starting line, and you might feel behind. I'm here to provide hope, support, and practical tips, and to let you know that you're not alone. Hello, hello, welcome. Today's topic is the question, is this a problem? And this was inspired by a conversation with a client of mine, either this week or last week, where she said, I realized you're teaching me not to make problems where there are none. And besides just loving that, I thought that was a hilarious thing to say. It really got me thinking about this idea of what is a problem. Okay, as usual, when I'm talking about a word, I'm going to do a quick description of the word, a dictionary definition. I'm going to go with dictionary.com here. Problem as a noun, any question or matter involving doubt, uncertainty, or difficulty, a question proposed for solution or discussion, and then for adjective problem, difficult to train or guide, unruly, and the example they give is a problem child. And in literature, dealing with choices of action difficult either for an individual or for society at large, for example, a problem play. The reason I chose this one is because a problem child stuck out to me. That is definitely something that was leveled at me as a kid. I was labeled a difficult child for sure. And I also really resonate with the definition doubt, uncertainty, or difficulty. And my very first thought about this when I started thinking about is something a problem or is it not a problem is that it is a main underpinning of capitalist society that we are broken and our lives suck and could be way better, and the only way to fix them is by buying this product. That is a huge way that marketing works, and I think that marketing thinking and language has really pervaded our culture very, very deeply. And I'm a small business owner. I sell things. I have made some peace with the fact that I have to sell things, but I try really hard to make sure that when people are interacting with my sales, when I'm doing that, I always want to reinforce people's autonomy and make sure that they know that they are not the problem. And that's why, again, this definition with a problem child really popped out to me because I think we've all really heard this message over and over for a very long time that there is something wrong with us especially if we are outside the norm in any way or outside what is perceived as an acceptable set of identities and behaviors. So that's my first kind of major point about is this a problem or not, is that when we are raised with not only guilt but also shame, that definition of shame that's about us being broken and wrong, we feel like we are the problem. And to be clear, I never think that's the case. I think that's always a lie. You are not the problem. I'm not the problem. And I think there are loving ways to approach wanting to change or evolve or become the next version of ourselves that can be gentle and loving and nurturing and not based on fixing a problem within a person. And yes, I do mean that even with some fairly significant challenges, I really feel that when people are given support and love and having their basic needs met, and then given the opportunity to feel better and change and grow, I think most people want that most of the time. I really think most people are doing the best they can with what they have in the moment. So that's kind of my pat answer for this first one. Are you yourself a problem? I think no, no, you're not. Okay. What about circumstances in our life involving doubt, uncertainty, or difficulty? This I've been thinking about from the frame of self-confidence. And by that, I simply mean more or less believing that you can figure it out. So it may not be confidence that you can totally nail this new thing you've never done before. But if you're confident in it, the thought is, well, I can figure it out or I can ask for help and I can get help. So I think of confidence not being about purely your own skills and experiences, but about the ability to get these needs met in different ways, which could include asking for help. And from that perspective, 
when I believe, for example, that I'm able to figure something out, it kind of becomes, it's almost like the difference between a problem that sucks and feels like work and that I don't want to do versus a challenge that can be fun and that I get to learn and grow through it and that I'm actually kind of excited about learning something new. I'm going to use a really silly personal example. Almost four months ago, I bought a can of paint with the intention of painting my office. I have a wall behind me both at my desk and then when I'm sitting at my piano. So when I'm having students or having clients, either way, they can see this wall behind me and I wanted it to be blue instead of white. So I got this really nice kind of greenish teal color. It proceeded to take me three and a half months to actually get around to painting the wall. And yes, in the meantime, I kind of was making this a problem. I was seeing it as, well, first of all, this is just how my own personal neurodivergence plays out. So I was, it was giving myself a good amount of grace around that, knowing that even something that seems like it might be easy for someone else sometimes is really challenging for me. I did have to figure out a lot of little things that I'd never done before because I'd never done this particular task before. So there was some doubt. There was some uncertainty. There was some difficulty. And most of the time, it didn't feel like a problem because I wasn't going to completely derail, say, a work day to do this. I knew I was going to be doing it on a weekend or when I had a longer chunk of time. But when I did have those chunks of time that I could have theoretically solved this quote problem and I continued to not do it, my brain did start to go to this kind of adjective difficult to train or guide, unruly. That's the message I personally have received. One of the messages I've received about being a problem as a person is that these types of things being difficult for me, taking a long time, or even that after I finally did the painting, then I left some paint objects in the bathtub for a while until my partner was like, hey, when are you planning to clean those up? And I was like, I can do that now. I know this is a really small example, but it really did make me think about how a few years ago, I would have been really beating myself up about how long this took me. And the fact that when I finally did do it, and by the way, just you can't see where I am, but it's basically, I don't know, a 10 by 10 wall. It's like a square. So it's not very big, but doing those two walls took me about a day and a half, and I pretty much didn't do anything else on those days. I was exhausted. My joints were tired from the actual physical painting. My brain was weirdly exhausted, even though, again, this doesn't seem like a very huge task. And I think it's really easy when we're inside the situation to make assumptions about how someone else might be handling the situation or how, I don't know, a better version of us would handle the situation. And for me, with the painting the walls, it kind of kept flipping back and forth between feeling like a problem and feeling like not a problem at all. Some days I would just think, oh, it's totally fine. I'll get to it when I get to it. And some days I would go, oh, wow, it's been a month. It's been two months. It's been three months. I still haven't done this. And I hope it's easy to see you looking in on my life, how really whether or not this was a problem really did have to do with my perception of it, right? I ended up going very easy on myself and letting myself take as long as it took, and that's how long it took. So that's sort of an in-between example where you can kind of look at it and go, okay, my perspective on this probably helps define whether I'm experiencing it as a problem or not. And I think that's what that client was referring to at the beginning, the quote about, you're teaching me not to make problems where there are none. But I also think that idea can apply, if you want to, to things that might more objectively be considered a problem. So for example, an accident, an injury, an illness, losing something, breaking something, right? There are all these things that happen on a scale from very small to very large, right? The death of someone we love that anyone looking in on the situation, whether or not they know you, would say, yeah, okay, that's a genuinely difficult thing. Or yes, <laughs> this involves doubt and uncertainty and you don't know what's going to happen. I certainly think about this a lot with what's going on in the world with these huge, scary unknowns sometimes. And I have two directions I want to go with this. One, 
is that again, in that dictionary definition, that second noun definition was a question proposed for solution or discussion. So inherent in any problem, I think, is a question, which is, what can we do about it? And my brain's natural tendency is to go toward the, quote, problem solving side of things. So how do we fix this, change this, control this, etc.? And I think especially with just the magnitude of what's going on in the world and how overwhelming it is to try to address these questions and find solutions or even be a part of the discussion, something I've really been returning to for my own mental health and sanity is basically that it's okay for me to take a step back and be a little bit more removed from what I might consider the problem. And for me, that can either be cyclical, where I engage with it more, and then I complete the stress cycle and care for my nervous system and take care of myself. And we've got a great episode a little while back with Sally Hardy about completing the stress cycle, if you want to hear more about that. Or sometimes there is an issue or a problem that I can do nothing about, or that really is someone else's problem and I would love to step in and fix it, but I'm forcing myself to not be that person. Or it could just be a huge complex issue where I want to be a part of the solution, but I need to take a step back from, for example, the news cycle around it because that just stresses out my nervous system and makes it even harder to think creatively. And with all of those, they really involve just getting some distance from what is, again, objectively a problem in the world or in the life of a loved one, for example. And the more I've been doing that and the more I've been caring for my own system, at first, to me, it felt really selfish to disconnect in any way. I was like, no, part of what I can do is to be upset and stay involved so that I can use my, for example, anger as a fuel to help change things. And I heard a really great line from an activist in the summer of 2020 around Black Lives Matter. And I don't remember the name of the person who said this quote, but it was basically all of the activists who are here for the long haul are motivated by love and not by anger. Because being motivated by anger burns you out eventually. And yes, I do think all kinds of emotions can have a place as part of the solution, or certainly they're a part of our daily life. And accepting them and working with them and letting them move through the body ultimately tends to work better than just trying to ignore them or not have them. But that really stuck with me that being motivated by love long term helps you stay involved in the problems of the world. So by no means am I denying or diminishing the magnitude of the problems we're facing. I just know for myself, I can't be emotionally plugged into them all of the time. We need to be able to complete the stress cycle. We need to be able to receive care and we need to be able to nurture our systems and have this cyclical rhythmic approach as much as possible. And yes, being able to disconnect in any way is a privilege in itself. I absolutely recognize that. And I always feel like I'm not doing enough and that I probably should be doing more. And that could be objectively true. I'm just also really trying to not be the white person who shows up and is just upset because I'm just processing this stuff for the first time. I'm trying to do a lot of my emotional processing on my own and with other white people, for example, so that I can show up when I can show up and really be fully present. So that's kind of my personal thoughts where I'm at right now with sort of what is a problem? You are not a problem. There's a lot of stuff kind of in the middle that could go either way, depending on your frame of mind and how it's interacting with other factors in your life. Things can feel like more of a problem at some times than others. And then there are what I would consider objectively real problems in the world, such as white supremacy and income inequality and all of the other isms that hurt people. And now I want to take one of those ideas I just said from the big issues and loop it back to the medium ones, because this is where it's been really useful for me. So when I learned slash relearned slash recognized that it was really important for me to take care of my system and complete the stress cycle in order to stay present for helping the activists who are really out there all the time and supporting them 
and then being able to do what work I also do to do direct aid or helping people. I realized that all those sort of medium, especially on the lower side of medium, right? The ones that are the problems that are really not problems, but that I'm used to thinking of as problems, partly because of cultural messaging and training. And you may have heard this in various forms. ADHD brains sometimes seek drama because it gives us dopamine. So having problems and being able to express those problems and live in them to some extent can give us a certain amount of dopamine. And for a dopamine deficient brain, that can actually be very meaningful. So no judgment there. That's just a thing that can happen. And I realized for me personally, staying submerged in the drama or kind of activating or elevating small problems in my own life was actually making it harder for me to show up for the objective problems. So for me, that was something that was really important to me to at least consider and begin addressing. And it turns out that once you start letting some of those little to medium problems go, or and I'm going to get into this in a minute, just kind of waiting sometimes works and not trying to solve them right away. It actually feels really good because then you're experiencing fewer problems in the moment other than losing those dopamine hits. It mostly feels really good. So it kind of is self-sustaining in that sense, if that feels good to you. And I specifically for myself tried a bunch of different practices. So I don't necessarily have one cure-all for this, but if this is something you want to try, just sort of letting your own small problems go a little bit more so that you can be a little bit more present to the bigger problems when they come up. First of all, this is a purely individual autonomous choice in terms of deciding what you might want to apply this to. I'm not suggesting anything in particular. I know for me, one sort of category of issues was very, very close family members and friends making choices and especially relationship choices that appeared to be hurting them. So dating someone who maybe was not actively abusive, although sometimes was, but you know, the, that sort of category of subtle, not great behavior where you can't really label it abuse. You can't really get super upset about it, but you don't love seeing it. And I spent so much time some years ago, just thinking about and trying to solve in my own head, my friends' relationships problems and my close siblings. And there was a point where I realized they don't even want this help. This is just difficult for my own brain. It's just stressing me out. And I don't want to have this kind of relationship with these people. I want to let them do their own thing. So in, I don't know, roughly 2016-ish, around this whole category of things, other people's relationship issues, unless they were directly asking me for advice, I just decided this was not my problem anymore. And this is an interesting one for me because it's not even necessarily saying that there's no problem there. There could have been some, there were some legitimate problems. Almost all of those relationships I'm thinking of right now have ended for a reason, but it helped me and my system so much to just take that step back. And in that case, I pretty much just decided. And then, and then after the decision, it's just practice. So every time the urge came up, I just practiced setting it back down. And while I've tried some different things, like for example, the Sedona method, which is around letting things go and some other modalities to just let things go. And that can be really useful to kind of figure out what that actually feels like. For the most part, this is not a fancy practice to just kind of decide, I'm not going to let this be this much of a problem anymore. I'm not going to try to solve it. And I do want to mention intrusive thoughts at this point, because depending on how your brain works, you may experience something along these lines as being something that you can't set down or that feels very, very difficult to set down and kind of keeps coming back. And that's where I recommend a physiological interrupt where you actually use your body to do something else. And there are a whole bunch of things that work like bilateral stimulation or shaking or jumping, moving your body. Basically what you're looking for is a state change. Also sometimes just like sticking your tongue out and making a noise going, ah, just, you know, letting some sound and movement out can be really helpful. And it almost doesn't matter what it is because the point is just to interrupt that thought pattern over and over. And it can feel really slow and frustrating at first when it comes up over and over and over. 
But the more you just say to yourself, hey, cool, we're not going to do that. And we're not going to fight it either. I'm not going to sit here and fight with myself or argue with my own brain. If my brain is feeding me nonsense, I can just say, cool, yeah, maybe, which is actually a practice in itself, just kind of choosing not to argue with your brain and going, yeah, that, that could be when it tells you terrible nonsense. And then the last kind of practice I will suggest today, if you want to try this, is on occasion, especially actually if this is going really well, if you're like, yeah, actually, I am feeling more calm and more able to set things down and everything is going a little more smoothly. I'm a little less plugged into the drama. Sometimes it can be useful to see what the opposite side of that is like. So sometimes when, again, when my brain is feeding me nonsense, when my brain is giving me these repetitive negative thoughts, sometimes I just dive all the way in. I'm like, okay, what is the logical conclusion if I just follow this fear thought all the way through? And I've seen versions of this type of technique in both CBT and somatics. So it can either be more of a brain exercise or more of a felt exercise, kind of letting a feeling take over versus the sort of logical conclusion verbal side of it. I've gotten something out of both sides of that. So I think it really just depends on what you feel like. But it's basically just saying, okay, brain, yeah, let's run with this worst case scenario. What, what happens? What happens if I let this problem run all the way out? So for example, when I decided to stop interfering in other people's relationships, the first time that someone close to me was having a really hard time, but also did not want advice or help and did not want to leave the relationship. I kind of did this with myself. I was like, what is the absolute worst that can happen? Well, in this case, the other person was not actively abusive as far as I knew. So I was like, the worst that can happen is that my friend could be miserable or, you know, not live their best life for a while or even years. And as soon as I kind of realized that the worst thing that was going to happen was that my friend was basically going to get to make their own choices and have the life that they say they want to have for now. I was like, oh yeah, that probably is kind of inappropriate for me to even think about interfering in that. Like they get to make their own choices. And anyway, that's again, a pretty small example, but it did help me to detach emotionally a little bit. And just kidding. I'm going to give you one more which is sort of in the vein of letting go, but it's a more active act of offering. So I really love this. This is another one that I do both as sort of a mental verbal exercise and as a physical exercise. If you believe in anything in particular, it doesn't have to be God, but if you believe that there's anything bigger than us that we don't understand, which I sort of do, I have complicated beliefs that I won't get into, but I do believe there are things we don't understand. I will offer up the problem, my feelings about it, whatever. And I usually do this with an actual physical gesture of just sort of holding my hands up to the sky, just sort of like a here, you take it. One way I've heard it put that I really like is offering the problem to love. I just like that. I think it's nice. And for me, this works with the big stuff and the little stuff because the little stuff, it feels really good to just go here, love, you take this problem for now. And with the big stuff, it feels a little bit more weighty or meaningful. But ultimately what this practice does for me, again, because I don't necessarily believe in a whole bunch, is it's setting it down for now. You can always dredge a problem back up if you want to, even if you really thoroughly process something and set it down and haven't thought about it in a while. Our brains are very capable of picking it back up if we want to. So even if you really set something down and are feeling a lot better about it, You can always get all your anxiety back later if you so choose. And in the meantime, letting go and giving your system a break can be a really powerful way to train yourself to be able to engage more and to be able to be part of the solution later when something comes along or when you yourself have a creative idea about how to be part of the solution. That's a lot more likely to happen when your brain is rested and safe because that's when we have access to our creative problem solving. And since I mentioned the Sedona method, I think this was something I heard from one of their tapes at some point. The phrase was something like, you only need to understand a problem if you're planning to have it again. 
And that was around the idea of letting things go and letting them not be problems for those middle problems where you kind of have a choice of perspective. And that's another line that's really stuck with me. You only need to understand a problem if you're planning to have it again, because otherwise you can just let it go and it doesn't matter. You don't need to know why. Well, for some brains, my brain always wants to know why, but that's my own, uh, personal journey is being able to let some of that desire go because sometimes things just happen and there's not a reason and it's just chaos and we can make more out of that if we want to. But I'm personally trying to save my energy for the big stuff and the big problems because I really do want to be part of the solution. And it's a lot easier to do that when my system is relatively regulated and can get some rest in between the work. Thanks so much for being here today and for listening. If you are neurodivergent, queer, brilliant, creative, or even if you don't identify with those words specifically, but you have an unusual brain, and if any of those things feel like a problem in your life, or you're trying to figure out how to use the brain you have to build the life you want, I help people with unusual brains learn to love their brain and have it become one of their biggest allies. One-on-one -on -one clients I've worked with have gotten back into their creative practice, they've quit smoking and drinking, they've set boundaries and built healthier relationships and made big life transitions with the lowest anxiety they've ever experienced making those kinds of big decisions. Just wanted to let you know that that's a thing I do. And if you're interested, you can go to matiamaray.com and the tab, love your brain. Thanks again for being here and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. If you know someone who would be helped by this podcast, please share it with them. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and suggestions at matia at matiamaray.com. That's M-A-T-T-I-A -T -T at M-A-T-T-I-A-M-A-U-R-E-E -E dot com. Thank you.